formulate in our mind what holiness is. We, Kay Smith in her book, she, she talks about like this view that she always had when she was a young woman of a holy woman was a woman who had no sense of humor, who wore no makeup, who was very judgy and very stern. And, you know, so her mind of, of holiness, in her mind what holiness was, was something that she never wanted to be. But then you look at Hollywood's view or the world's view of holiness, and she, she um, talked about the contrast between, like, in the, West, the old westerns, you had the woman in the saloon, and she was basically a harlot. So she was a harlot from a saloon, but she was the kind one and really nice, and so everybody loved her. And then there was the, the woman in the village who her, her clothes were buttoned up to here, and, every, and she was judging everyone around. And so, again, the Hollywood's view was also skewed that the, that the holy woman was the harlot and the unholy woman, you know what I mean? So both views are wrong. Both we, views are unbiblical. And so it's really important that we understand biblically what holiness is. And again, we strive to be holy, but we can't. We, I mean, we, it's like trying to bear fruit for the Lord. Like, have you ever seen a tree sitting there going, mm, trying to pop out the fruit? You know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> You know, trying to bear fruit. And, you know, it just doesn't. Holiness comes from the spirit of God living within us, spending time in God's presence. Holiness is about just just being who God already sees us as. It's not something we have to really work at. Um, just being in his presence, just spending time with him, naturally those attributes are going to just come out. And that's the beauty of God, what he, he, he provides for us. He equips us, you know. And, and so I don't want anybody to approach this with this feeling of, man, I'm just not good enough. I just, it's too hard. I'll never be holy. It's like, look, the Lord is the one who transforms us, and he will do it until the day of completion. And we just have to be present and, and willing, and God will do the rest because he is so wonderfully faithful and so patient. So I'm really excited about um, the, this. Uh, Mary Kay is going to share a song with us at the end. And that's why we only did one song in the beginning um, that God put on her heart. But what a gifted lady she is. She, she's a, a, a worship leader and a wonderful um, teacher of the word. And I, I just love that, you know, in, in this season of her life, she's willing to be used by God. And, um, you know, a lot of us are like, I'm tired. <laughs> I've spent my many years serving God. Now it's time for me to sit. Not, not this one. And I mean, I think about the heart of Chuck Smith, our, you know, the founder of Calvary Chapel. He preached on a Sunday morning, four services, and then he went to be with the Lord on Tuesday. He had um, cancer. And so that man, you know what I'm saying? That's really our call is that we serve God until our dying breath. And it's just something that I aspire to as well. But I I just love that Mary Kay has such a gift, and she's like, I'm just going to use it. I'm going to use it until the, the Lord comes back. So welcome, our friend. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. But I have to give God the glory <clears throat> because it's him. If it wasn't for him, I would be dead today. Really, that's true. If you ever heard my testimony, I should not be here. But for the grace of God who saved me, who came to me when in a very dark place, and he saved me and redeemed me. And then even the long years of work afterwards, um, you know, he was still sanctifying me, making me more like him, and, and healing me because I had so much pain. But just know that it's an ongoing work that he does, and I can take no glory, for he gets the glory. So when you see me worshiping like I do, it's because I have been forgiven much. And I know how much he's done for me. And um, I love him with all my heart for what he's done. Praise God. Um, let's just open with prayer, okay? Thank you so much, Father, for the day, this day, Father, that is yours. And I thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be holy like you are holy. And that you do the sanctification, that you are the one that, that works in us to bring these things to pass. And that you love us and you already see us. You see us complete 
and holy. You see what we're going to be when we're with you in heaven. And you love us so much. And I just pray for the ladies. I pray that you they'd be able to receive what you had to say and that you would speak through me, that it would not be my words, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just move this morning on the ladies and on their hearts, Father God, that they would hear what you have to say to them, that they are holy, that you want them to be holy and set apart for the ministry and the work that you have for them. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. I was so blessed um, yesterday or the day before, the, I guess it was the day before yesterday on the 17th when um, Kelly sent out her email. And for those that don't have Flock Note, you really need to get it because um, it's a lot of good information. But in her email, I want to read this to you. It really blessed me. It's she, she wrote that truly a woman who reflects God's holiness has many wonderful traits that glorify him. She is vibrant because she continually overflows with living water. Amen. She is radiant because she walks in the light of Jesus. She is peaceful because her mind is stayed on him. She is joyful because she walks in obedience and knows her sin has been dealt with. She is satisfied because her hope is in Jesus and he is her fulfillment. And she is loving because she walks in prayerful communion with Jesus. What a blessing it is to be his daughter. Amen. I love that. Thank you, Kelly. That blessed me. And, and it is a blessing to be a daughter of the king. Um, as I'm, I'm going to read Colossians uh, 3, uh, 2 through 14. But as we're doing that, if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14. And I'm going to read Colossians 3, 12 through 14. If anyone wants my notes, I'll be happy to share them with you. Um, but Colossians 3, uh, 12 through 14 says, To put on, then, as chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, put on kindness, put on humility, put on meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. We need to forgive, as the Lord has forgiven us, so you must forgive and above all these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Praise God. We are to live in peace with, with one another as we're holy. He says, as we run this race, what is our goal? And Hebrews, if you're there, Hebrews 12, 14 says, to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no one can see God. Holiness is not a possibility for the Christian. Holiness is a requirement. He requires it. The difference between God and us is that he is inherently holy, while we, on the other hand, only become holy in relationship to him. And all these wires are driving me crazy here. To be holy means that we are first to be set apart for honorable use. He set us apart. We're different. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're set apart for his use. Um, because of time, I'm going to read most of these scriptures. In 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. We are his special people set apart for him, that you may proclaim the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God. Praise God, we're the people of God who are, have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We're set apart. We are not. We're, we're his. We're his chosen people. We're his holy nation. This is not a new concept. God always wanted a people that were set apart for him, his own people. If you go back to Exodus, um, as he brought the people out of Egypt, he wanted those people to be set apart wholly unto him. He always had a plan to have his own people. And um, if you go to Exodus, Exodus 9, 1, and I'll read it for you, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. See? Let my people go. His people. In some tr translations say, Let my people go, that they may worship me and me alone. God's reason for wanting them out of Egypt, 
and out of bondage and out of slavery, out, away from their taskmasters, was primarily to shower great ble- was not primarily to shower blessings on them. Though he did that, he showed them great wonders. He did mighty things for them. But the real reason is because he wanted to have a people that were unencumbered in their service and worship to him. He wanted them set apart. He wanted them not have the distractions of everything else. He wanted a people that was his own special, holy people. Undistracted intimacy is what he wanted. Undivided attention. His own special people where their eyes were truly focused on him. This is not new. Even today, he wants us to be a people, his own special people. Yes, we're in the world, but we're still his. We're set apart. We're unique And that's okay that we're unique and we're different. We're like Jesus. He says in Deuteronomy 14.2, he says, For you are a people holy to your Lord God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. See, we're his treasured possession. They were his treasured possession. He loved them dearly. He desired them dearly. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, he chose them and he treasured them above all. He chose them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I think that's pretty awesome because even today, we are a special people. Remember what we said, you know, in Peter, he says, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we might show forth the praises of God. He has set us apart. We're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be like the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are called out. We are set apart for his use. Uh, Titus 3, 3 through 6, if you want to turn there. Um, Titus 3, 3 through 6. But he wants us apart, and I just, I love it that God cared so much. If you look throughout the whole Bible, um, as he pulled up people out of, uh, out of Egypt, I mean, it was a constant story all through the Old Testament that the people would come to him, and then they would walk away, and he would woo them back, constantly wooing them back because he loved them so, he desired them so. Uh, Titus 3, 3 through 6 says, For we ourselves were also foolish, We were disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not of works of righteousness, which we have done, no, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Salvation came not only because of God's kindness and love, but also because of his mercy. He was merciful. All through the Old Testament, he was merciful. Even today, he is so merciful, wanting us changed. He wants to see us, and he's kind, and he's long-suffering, and and wanting and desiring us to be that people that he's called us to be. Um, He saved us. How? Through the miracle of new birth. We're all born again. And if you don't know what being born again is and what it is to be separate and and called unto God, come talk to one of us and let us talk to you about Jesus and hear about being born again. The word washing means bathe all over. So he washes us completely. We're bathed all over. When a sinner trusts in Christ, he is cleansed for all of his sins and he is made a new person by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is who took the initiative to pull us out of our former lifestyles. We didn't do it on our own. He pulled us out. He set us apart. He pulled the people out of Egypt and set them apart to make them a holy people, a special people unto him. Today, through Jesus, through the blood of Christ, he has set us apart to make us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we should show forth praise to him. We're to be separate. The Lord took the initiative to pull us out of our former lifestyles. He saved us, he cleansed us, and he set us apart for righteousness. And the pursuit of holiness, which we should be pursuing each day, does not end when we become Christians. When you become born again, that pursuit doesn't end. It's an ongoing work, an ongoing thing. There is positional holiness, which we inherit when we're born again and practical holiness, which we must actively pursue. 
We're in the world. We're going to be tempted by things, right? We need to do house cleaning all of the time. We need to make sure that there's not things in our life that are causing us not to be able to do or be all that God wants us to be. We need to be house cleaning all the time and pulling those things out. It's an active working that we need to be doing. We can't do it on our own. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is who's going to help you. He's going to convict you. He's going to tell you. He's going to remind you. He's going to show you what needs to be changed because he wants you. I mean, he's working with God. They're working together to bring you to that place where he wants you to be, one with him. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's only when we abide in Christ that we will bear the fruit required to live that holy life. Again, we can't do it on our own. Sorry, this is driving me crazy. It is only through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, abiding in Christ, that we can be holy. John 15, 5, 15, 5 says, I am the vine, just like uh, Kelly was saying earlier, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We need to be a branch. We need to abide in Christ. And that's where our holiness will come from. By when we are a branch attached to the vine, we are fully submitted to the vine for substance. Jesus is the vine. So we're getting all that we need straight from him. All of our sustenance, sorry, sustenance comes from him and solely from him. Our job is not to bear the fruit. Can a branch bear fruit on its own? No. It absolutely needs the vine. It needs Jesus and also needs the Father who takes care of the garden. We can't do it on our own. Our job is simply to abide in Christ, to abide in him and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Allow yourself to be a branch submitted to God and abiding on the vine. God calls us to be holy just as he is holy. That's from 1 Peter 1.16. He says, you shall be holy for I am holy. It is vital to understand that apart from God, this is impossible. Apart from the vine, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can. Um, I loved it when I, this summer, my small group and I, we, we, um, we were looking at the Holy Spirit, and we were talking about um, we being uh, the branches and the vine and the Father being the husband, that the, the one that takes care of the garden. And that how um, it was liberating for me when I heard that it was not my responsibility to, to bear the fruit. My responsibility is simply to abide in Jesus. Abide in Jesus. And how do we do that? Reading his word like we're doing today, being in fellowship, hearing God's word, by casting our cares one upon another, praying for one another, abiding in Jesus, doing those things that God's called us to do as saints. That's how. And when we are abiding in Christ, that holiness will come. That fruit will come. You're going to have love. You're going to have peace. You're going to have patience. You're going to have all those things that naturally will come. And we will be holy, and you will be set apart. You will be different naturally because you're in his presence all the time. You will, you will be different. You will be. Um, I love, I don't know if any of you ever go to um, gotquestions.org. Um, my pastor in Florida, I have Pastor Randy here where I live, but in, when we lived in Florida, we had a pastor um, that we, in a Calvary Chapel that we just loved. And he recommended the uh, gotquestions.org, and I love that site. It gives you a lot of good information. And what is sanctification? And this is what Got Questions had to say. Sanctification is God's will for us. Absolutely. The word sanctification is related to the word saint. Both words have to do with holiness. To sanctify something is to set it apart for special use. To sanctify a person is to make him holy. See, God sanctifies us through the blood of Christ. He wants it set apart, apart for him, for his use and his use alone. He will make those changes in us as we abide in him and allow that fruit to grow in us. Sanctification is mentioned, um, and 
in, in this verse, the verse, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 30, it said um, that it, it is a once forever separation of believer, believers unto God. We're once and forever separated, always and always underneath him. Praise God. Um, we need to consider ourselves dead to sin. Romans, um, that's from Romans 6, 11. Refusing to revert back to the former lifestyles of the old. We're to remember that we are holy. We are God's chosen people. We need to be separate. And there is cooperation between God and his children in sanctification. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to work for his both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let me say that again. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation does not suggest to work for your salvation. Paul was writing to saints. He wasn't talking to unbelievers. The verb work out here it means to work to full completion, like working out a problem in math, or in Paul's day, this term is used to describe working a mine, that is, getting out of the mine the valuable or, or possible, or working a field. You have a field, you're a farmer, and getting all the, the best harvest you possibly can get by working that field. We're to work out our salvation that same way. And how do we do that? By reading his word, abiding in Christ, praying, being in fellowship, doing those things that are godly and that he would call us to do. Um, we need to, working out your salvation means to do everything possible by submitting to God to achieve Christ-likeness, to be conformed to the image of Christ. God has a timeline for the virtues that he wants to cultivate in our lives, and he does. He wants to cultivate. He wants to use us. He wants to bring us to that full completion to the end. Um, our responsibility is to yield to his wishes and work out with focused attention the things that he wants us to grow in. When the Holy Spirit convicts us or points out a sin or a flaw he wants to change, we need to be immediately obedient. Don't hesitate. When he says something, be immediately obedient. I know myself. I love movies. I love some TV shows that are on. But I've found that um, I'm having to separate myself from a lot of those things. I can't watch them anymore. I used to, but I'm having to turn these things off. Um, as much as I love the storyline, but they're just too much things that are not for us to hear, things that are not godly, things that we shouldn't be hearing. Um, he wants us separate from that. Um, if you hear the Holy Spirit telling you, you know, he will, he's going to talk to your conscience. He's going to talk to you. He's going to remind you. Don't do that. Immediately stop. Stop. Stand there and stop and say, okay, Lord, and turn the other way. Don't wait, but turn the other way. There's a reason, a good reason. And I know for me, I've had to stop watching different shows, which makes me sad because some of them I really enjoyed, but because God doesn't want me to. I can't. I can't. Those are not things. Those are not things that are going to bring me to holiness or godlikeness. It's not going to do that for me. It's only going to bear fruit that's not good. Um, God has, as I said, God has a timeline for the virtues He wants to cultivate in us. Our responsibility is to yield and work out with focused attention the things He wants us to grow in. Um, our lives, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have t tremendous potential. Like a mine or a field, a mine like that has coal in it or gems in it, that, you know, those, those wonderful things. He wants us to help fulfill that potential. We need to work out our salvation, work out every day, moving closer to him. Eagerly seek to know him more. Eagerly move forward to seek him more and more. Um, in Psalms 119.11, it says, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, that's how you do it. You hide the word of God in your heart, and then you don't sin. You don't, you don't sin, and you could be set apart for him. Sin is hideous. It keeps us from the best God has for you. It won't, if you're a Christian and you sin, you're not going to go to hell. No. But it's going to keep you from God's best for you. Okay, if you watch movies... 
It's just going to keep you from God's best. It's not going to keep you from being saved, but it will keep you from God's best for you. Sin likes to hide, and it doesn't like the light. God often compares sin to leprosy. If you look at the Old Testament, he did that often. Um, The reason he did that, I believe, is because of how hideous and debilitating that disease is. Leprosy, as I did some research on it, I didn't realize it. It could stay hidden in somebody's life for 10 years at least, only known to the person that has it. They can completely hide it. All they have to do is make sure they wear certain clothes and just because it does do some nerve damage, um, they need to make sure they watch how they they move or their mannerisms. Um, It was a terrible, lonely disease if you were a a Jewish person, you know, because you were separate. You were made to be outside of the camp. You weren't allowed to be around anyone. Um, God found that very serious. Um, God often compared that leprosy to sin. You see, like sin, leprosy can be hidden from others for a short time. You know, our sin, we could hide things that we're doing that nobody else knows about, right? We can appear completely normal. We could be serving in church, active in fellowship, dressed beautifully, all buttoned up, looking really good. Our Facebook page looks wonderful, like ah, we got, we're at the top of the world, we have everything. Looking like a perfect Christian, yet underneath that disease rages. That disease rages. And I'm going to say, it doesn't have to be just sin. It could be just pain. Maybe you have unforgiveness. Maybe there's something else in your life that um, hurt you long ago that you haven't dealt with. Um, Those are things that are going to hinder your relationship with the Lord. And he wants you to to have his light shine on that and to free you. Um, One of my favorite Bible stories is about Naaman. Remember Naaman? If you look at 2 Kings, that's the first time you see Naaman. Um, and Naaman, this is how the Bible describes him in 2 Kings 5.1. Naaman, he was a captain of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master, highly respected because of, of what Naaman had done. The Lord had given victory, that Naaman had... Um, had given victory to the king of Syria. So he was very, very pleased with him. The man was also a valiant warrior. He was a celebrated leader He was in the army. Everyone respected him. He was highly reverenced. He had great wealth. He had a wonderful household. He had fame. Yet he had a secret. And the Bible says he was a leper. And there he was. He was functioning every single day. But he knew, not everybody knew, the king knew he had leprosy, we find out. But many people didn't know he had leprosy, had no idea. So he was dealing with this. Praise God, he was freed from that leprosy. We're not going to go into that. But what I want to say is that we can function every single day. He was a functional leper. He went around functioning every single day. Don't be like that. Functioning with that sin and hiding in you and that's, that's, that debilitating, awful thing that's separating you from God. God's called us to be holy. He's called us to be set apart. He's called us to be different, unique. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation that we should show forth his praises. We need to release those things and let God speak to them and, and free you. Um, For sure, hidden leprosy will keep us from holiness. It will keep you from the wonderful thing God has for you. It will cause us to wither and shrink and hinder us from growing any fruit at all, eventually. Maybe not right away. Maybe you can watch that movie. Maybe you can watch that TV show. Maybe you can be angry with that person and not forgive them. Um, But eventually, it is going to show up. It is going to start to... um, bear its own type of fruit. We need to be authentic with God and with others. God's word says to confess our faults one to another that we might be healed. What I really love about the small group that I have, um, and even through the summer when we weren't allowed to be together here, um, that we really began to get really close together and we were able to confess our sins one to another and our faults one to another and pray for one another. Reach out to someone. If you have something that you, you need help with, reach out to your sisters in Christ. I think you're going to get a really good response, and they're going to be standing with you to help you, to hold you accountable, to make you, to bring those forth those changes. They're going to stand with you and pray with you and help you. 
for sure. Allow God into those secret places of our heart. To live a holy life needs to be separate. To live a holy life means to separate ourselves from sin. We must see ourselves as God does, as born-again children of the Most High, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Um, In Reflecting God, I'm going to read one part that she said that really touched me. It's on page 54. She says, Choose the holy path. You have a choice about the kind of woman you want to become. No one can make that choice for for you. No one can make it for you. You have to do it yourself. Which path do you desire? Proverbs 4.18 tells us, The path of the just is like the shining light that shines ever brighter into the perfect day. It's your choice. It is your choice. You're not going to lose your salvation, but your, your fruit is not going to be what God would want. So you're not going to have all the full benefits of everything that God has for you. Praise God. He is good. Um, humble, he's, the Bible says to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. If you humble yourself and give him these things, he will lift you up and he will heal you. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. As a spirit-filled believer, remember that you have the Holy Spirit living in you. He is able, this is in Ephesians 3.20, one of my very favorite verses. It says, he is able to do far more abundantly than we can, we can all ask or think according to the power at work in us. If we go to him and ask him, that Holy Spirit that lives in us is able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever possibly ask or think through the power, which is the Holy Spirit that lives in us, to make those changes, to make us reflect Jesus, to make us reflect holiness, to bear that fruit that God has. You are a daughter of the King. You are clothed in righteousness, and you are holy. Praise God. Amen. We're going to share a song if if, um, Millie and Ashley are going to. And it's, um, the Lord just put the song on my heart. It's a prayer um, as um, I'm singing it and we're leading it to, for you, I pray that you would just ask the Lord in. If there's something that's separating you that you need a prayer for, go to him, ask him. And then later on, go to your sisters in Christ. They love you dearly. He wants you holy. He wants you set apart for him and for his purpose. Search my heart, know me, every part complete. Set apart to make me holy. Give me sight to know me. What you like, lead me to your heart, Lord. Make me 